Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Myth Salon. Well, today I am coming to you from Santa Cruz. My wife and I have moved up here after living in our home for 40 years. And what an adventure this has been. The whole move idea came together in a period of about three months. We sold one house, bought another one, decided that Santa Cruz is the place that we could live out our days. And that's kind of an unorthodox way to go about things. Uh, we wanted to approach the future with the idea that, you know, let's meet it head on. Let's, we took a walk in the Redwoods. We said, we can live here. This is a good place to live. So I never know what is going to happen when complexity and simplicity, when the imminent and the transcendent meet head on at this threshold place. And I'm struck by how often we find ourselves falling away from the oneness of everything into the something quality of something specific. We narrow our worldview and we narrow our world. So today I'd like to, I'd like to open up with a, with a short poem. And it is, it's called The Mysterious Tao. Everything in nature is fleeting leaves turn color and fall away. Trees grow old and some decay. Caterpillars transform in a glorious metamorphosis into butterflies. While with the mountain winds and ocean tides, they come and go. Yet beneath the face of impermanence, beneath the face of impermanence, the earth moves in cycles, guided by an invisible ever presence whose intentions are pure, wise, and all knowing. From sunset to sunrise, through the cycles of the seasons, the Tao gives breath to both the seen and the unseen, to the wild, to the tranquil, to the sublime. So as we go forth, as we do, I would like to open it up with a moment of silence. And let's think about what brings value, what brings virtue, how cherished we all are and fortunate to be in the community we call ourselves together. Now today we actually have on our panel that Will will introduce in a moment, we have Jonas who has done his own myth salon and Jonas plays the shakuhachi flute. And with his permission, I would love to invite Jonas before we do the introductions and let's do a little Shakuhachi. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, I just want to, uh, <clears throat> so happy to be with you. I, I'm in Western Massachusetts in Northampton, and uh, this is Shakuhachi music, um, Katagana script. Uh, my teacher's in Kyoto. Um, I met him in seminary. So the Buddhist practice, I'll play, play a short piece. The Buddhist practice is called Ichiyanjubutsu, um, to become Buddha in one sound. 
So to bring full awareness to each breath as it travels down through the length of the shakuhachi of the bamboo. Uh, it's just breath and bamboo, so simple. Um, <clears throat> so I will play a little, um, I'll play this piece because it's a serious time. Uh, uh, it's called Kojo no Tsuki, Moon Over the Ruined Castle. And this piece I played in August for um, the uh, memorial for the bombings in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, and this, uh, just before I played the piece, I happened onto a documentary that the, when the Enola Gay dropped the bomb, um, there were 45 seconds between the dropping of the bomb and when it hit the streets and um, exploded above the streets in uh, Hiroshima. People were going about their normal lives. So, you know, it, when we talk about um, living a normal life, if, if there is such a thing, an impermanence, um, sometimes uh, we have only 45 seconds to live and we'd never know it. Um, so every moment is precious. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonas. <clears throat> well, it's my honor to introduce the panel tonight. Looking forward to this evening. I think uh, many of you, uh, probably like me, a primary introduction to anything that has perennial in the, the title of beginning of a conversation around philosophy, mythology, religious studies is going to go to Aldous Huxley. So I'm really looking forward to where we go tonight with Rami, and I'd like to go beyond my initial introduction uh, from Aldous. Um, you all know Dana White, the host of the Myth Salon, uh, producer, publisher, and a contributing member of Pacifica's Myth faculty. I'm Will Lynn, moderator of this Myth Salon and founder of MythHouse.org. I chair the general education department at Hushin College, where I teach myth to storytellers and co-host a TV series on myth in Germany uh, for ZDF called Myths, the Greatest Mysteries of Humanity. Uh, <clears throat> you just heard from Robert A. Jonas, who received his doctorate in education from Harvard and his master in, master's in theological studies from Weston Jesuit School of Theology. Uh, he is the author of The Essential Henry Nguyen. Jonas is, uh, as he's known, was trained in object relations psychology at Harvard and used his postdoc master's in spirituality to explore the healing resonances between Christian contemplative prayer, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and Buddhist meditation. He founded the Empty Bell Sanctuary in Western Massachusetts in 1994 and now leads interfaith contemplative groups on Zoom. He's a biographer of Henry Nguyen and a student of Sui Zen, the Japanese bamboo flute. He's performed in many secular and spiritual contexts and has played uh, at three Buddhist Christian retreats with the Dalai Lama. 
So you guys get to, uh, you guys know me, we're going to go through a few of these and one of my favorite things to do. And one of the things I get to do is go through all these wonderful introductions of these wonderful people. We're also joined tonight by Ed Bastian, who's the president of the Spiritual Paths Foundation and holds a PhD in Buddhist studies. He's an award-winning author of Living Fully, Dying Well, and author of Inner Spiritual Meditation and Mandala, Creating an Authentic Spiritual Path. Former Fulbright Fellow in India, Ed has worked closely with over 50 Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Taoist, and Native American contemplative, contemplative teachers. He's a former Smithsonian Institution Program Director of Biodiversity, as well as teacher of Buddhism and world religions. He produced acclaimed documentaries on religion for the BBC and PBS, and a film series on Tibetan Buddhism funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Gary S. Broboff is the founder of Jungian Online, Connecting Clients and Analysts, and Jung Academy, Personal Growth Courses for Everyone. He's the author of the best-selling Knowledge in a Nutshell, Carl Jung, and, his degree, and has degrees from the University of British Columbia, Canada, and Pacifica Graduate Institute. Um, we're also joined uh, today by Dr. Dennis Patrick Slattery, is a distinguished emeritor professor, em emeritor, em emeritus professor in mythological studies at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpentria, California, where he has taught since the 1990s. He's the author, co-author, editor, co-editor of 30 volumes, including seven volumes of poetry and one novel. He's in the place where it's gone from reading the actual titles being long to even reading the categories becoming long. Uh, his latest collection of essays is The Way of Myth, Story, Subtle Wisdom. Uh, he offers retreats and workshops on exploring one's personal myth through the works of Joseph Campbell and Jung's Red Book. Connie Zweig, PhD, is a retired therapist and co-author of Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow and author of Meeting the Shadow of Spirituality in a novel, A Moth to the Flame, The Life of Sufi Ro Poet Ro Rumi. Her new best-selling book, The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, extends her work on the shadow into midlife and beyond and explores aging as a spiritual practice. It won the 2022 Gold Cover Award and 2022 Gold Nautilus Award, the 2021 Book Fest Award, and the 2021 Best Indie Award for Best Inspirational Nonfiction. Connie's been doing contemplative practices for more than 50 years. She's a wife, stepmother, and grandmother, and after all these roles, is now practicing a shift from role to soul. And finally... I get to introduce Rabbi Rami Shapiro, an award-winning author of over 36 books on religion and spirituality. He received rabbinical ordination from the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institution of Religion, and holds a PhD in religion from Union Graduate School. A rabbinic chaplain with the USAF for three years, a congressional rabbi, rabbi for 20 years, and a professor of religious studies for 10 years, Rabbi Rami currently co-directs the One River Foundation, uh, which we'll put the link, uh, for which we'll put the link in the chat here. Uh, Rami is also a contributing editor at Spirituality and Health Magazine, where he writes the roadside assistance for the Spiritual Travel Traveler column for the print magazine, the Spirituality and column for the digital magazine, and hosts the magazine's biweekly podcast, Spirituality and Health, with Rabbi Rami. And I'll put the link in here now. So thank you, uh, Rabbi Rami. Looking forward to this event tonight with you. I'm Dana, of, please. Well, Dana, you're stuck or I can introduce myself. I am, I am, oh, please I'm do, FOR, friend of Rami. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I am a New York Times bestselling author of um, four books. I have taught world religions at Piedmont University for 20 years, recently retired from that. Um, like Connie, I am deep, deep into shifting from role to soul and find it the most difficult thing I've ever done. Everybody in the world mm -hmm. wants to know what my next project is. And I want to say to have no project. So I'm happy to be here with all of you. Thanks, Barbara. Uh -huh. Rami, please. So it's now it's my turn. First of all, thank you for letting me you know, be part of this. I want to thank um, you know Dana and Will for hosting it and for all of these amazing people uh, to be on a panel. I'm not exactly sure what the panel is going to do with what I'm going to present, but my plan is to lay out something uh, that I've been wrestling with lately um, for about half an hour, maybe less if I can do it less, and then just open it up and see where you want to take this. So let me start with the premise. Premise is that humanity is going through a dark night of the soul. I think we can see it manifesting in a lot of different current events, war in Ukraine, occupation of Palestinian territories, oppression of Uyghurs, the, the, the ongoing problems with racism and anti-Semitism, violence against women, queer folk, 
Jews, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Asians, Hispanics. We see it in the weakening of democracies, the strengthening of autocracies, and in the global environmental disaster that is and will continue to have enormous cataclysmic impact on humanity and other species. I think we're seeing and we'll see even more. I mean, there's gonna be millions of humans dying from drought and famine and flood, fire, hurricanes, tsunamis, pandemics, rising seas, war, and civil unrest. There's gonna be a huge migration of people from countries most vulnerable to climate disaster, and it's gonna threaten already weakened democratic countries and fuel a rise in fascism as desperate people fearful of the other begin to back authoritarians and fascist regimes without regard for the welfare of others. This dark night, I think, is fueled by what Albert Einstein called humanity's optical delusion of dualistic consciousness. Seeing the world in a way that separates person from person and person from planet and pits person against person and persons against planet. If we are to move through this dark night, because you can't escape it, but maybe we can move through it. If we're going to move through this dark night, we must cultivate a new consciousness, one that honors differences, welcomes the uniqueness of each life, while at the same time knowing that all life is a manifesting of a non-dual reality that I call aliveness. We'll talk about that in a bit. That everything is a manifesting of this one thing, the way all waves the manifesting of the ocean that waves them. So this presentation is about cultivating this new consciousness. And I'm going to situate it within Judaism, because that's the tradition I know best. And in that context, shifting from the dualistic consciousness to the non-dual consciousness is shifting from what Judaism calls mochin de katnut, literally narrow mind, to Mohin de Godlut, spacious mind. And we're going to do this by referencing several Jewish texts and one contemplative Jewish practice. I'm going to start with the book of Genesis. Genesis offers us two different and mutually exclusive understandings of humanity. The first comes from chapter one, where humanity is created after everything else is created, and after everything else is thriving. God says, in chapter 1, verse 26, let's create humanity in our image after our likeness. The thing to know is there's no reason for the creation of humanity. They're completely irrelevant. The world is already thriving. Unlike in the following chapter, which I'll get to in a moment, where the earthling comes directly up from the earth, Humanity in chapter one has no connection to nature whatsoever. It's simply the result of the pure thought of the super, supernatural, or better, it's in a sense an afterthought, because again, creation is functioning quite well on its own. Because humanity in chapter one is alien to nature, I would suggest humanity in that story and, and those of us who link to that story or lean on that story, who are infected with that story, it causes us to feel alienated from nature as well, because in that story, there's no natural role for humans to play. Instead, the, the authors of this story imagine that the only thing that humans can do as alien invaders, basically, is to rule over nature, which in and of itself actually needs no ruler. God says to the humans, I'm quoting from Genesis 1:28, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I mean, this is the, the human fantasy of aliens whenever we started imagining aliens. They all, they, except for E.T., they always come to dominate the planet. So this is the alien and alienated myth fantasy of human beings. We're going to dominate nature. And it's a story that dominates Western civilization, and I suggest feeds the dark night that we're going through. 
Thankfully, it's not the only story that Genesis gives us. In the second chapter of Genesis, written at a different time by different people, we find a very different story. In this story, the earth is barren. Nothing is growing. There's no life at all. And the Bible says it lacks life because it's missing two things essential to life. The first one, the Bible says, is water. And the second one is a human caretaker devoted to cultivating life. So in the second story, God brings forth water from the ground. It rises up from the earth. And then God fashions an earthling from the now damp and malleable earth. God breathes consciousness into the earthling and gives it a very different mission than the one articulated in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, humanity's mission is not to dominate and rule over life, but to quote Genesis 2.15, to serve and guard life. A task that's made all the more important when you know that in the Hebrew, the word avodah, which means to serve, means not only to serve life as in the Genesis verse, it's also the word that's used for worship, that somehow to serve life is an act of worship, an act of sacred service, or what Genesis later calls in chapter 12, verse 3, being a blessing to all the families of the earth. So before I go on to, to the, how this connects to perennial wisdom, which I think it does, let me just raise a question that the rabbis raise when they read chapter two story of human creation. So they want to know, God creates the earthling, and it's a pun because the word for earth is Adama, and the word for the earthling is Adam. English Bible is translated as man, but that, there's another word that means man in Hebrew. Adam means human, but the pun is lost unless you go with earthling from the earth. The question the rabbis asked thousands of years ago is, what color is this earthling? Now, the rabbis who posed the question were themselves brown. Their question or their answer to the question, however, didn't promote brown privilege. They didn't promote any privilege. They taught that God gathered different colored soils, soils from, of every hue from all around the planet, and created the first earthling as a multicolored being at home in and raised up from all the soils of the earth. A teaching that should demand the renovation of stained glass Bible stories around the globe, where most of the characters are white, when in fact, there are no white people in the, in the Bible. So how does this connect to perennial wisdom? So I think it's too late to escape this dark night, but it's not too late to learn how to navigate it how to live as a blessing in the midst of the darkness. And to do this, we have to shift from a Genesis 1 mentality, the narrow mind of alienation, to a Genesis 2 mentality, the spacious mind of non-duality. And to do that, we have to leave behind parochial and tribalist worldviews that promote othering and move instead to a perennialist worldview that promotes unity. Now, I call this worldview perennial wisdom. And I, this is the way I define it. It's the fourfold truth found at the mystic heart of all religions. While perennial, religion, uh, perennial wisdom is, is articulated in different ways by different civilizations, if you go through them, including if you go through the way uh, Aldous Huxley does in, in his book, uh, Perennial Philosophy, you're gonna find four essential points that I think are common to the mystic traditions of all religions. Point number one, all life is a manifesting of non-dual dynamic aliveness, which people call by different names, Brahman, Godhead, Allah, Mother, yod heh vav -Hey, Dharmakaya, reality, whatever you wanna call it. We have different names, but the idea is that it's a non-dual dynamic reality. And I call it from the Jewish tradition, um, chayut, which means aliveness. Human beings, this is the second point, human beings have an innate capacity to awaken in, with, and as this aliveness. Number three, 
Awakening to aliveness calls us inwardly, not commands us from the outside. Awakening to aliveness calls us inwardly to treat all life with compassion, justice, and respect, to be what Genesis 12, 3 says, a blessing to all the families of the earth, all of them, it says, not just humans. And then point four is awakening to aliveness and being a blessing comprise the highest calling of every human being. To accept perennial wisdom, however it's articulated in various traditions, to accept it intellectually is one thing. To awaken to aliveness and to practice being a blessing to all the families of the earth is something else. And that requires not just an intellectual understanding of perennial wisdom, but a new way of seeing. To go back to what Einstein said, that the problem, the, the, the heart of our problem and the heart of what's fueling this dark night is this optical delusion of dualistic consciousness. It's an optics problem. We see the world incorrectly. And if, if you read the rest of what he says about it, he says basically you see the world as self and other, when in fact there is no self and other separate. There's only you know, a union and interdependence of self and other in the greater reality that I'm calling aliveness. So we have to see in a way that replaces the delusion of us versus them with the reality of all of us together. So how do you do that? Let's, let's go into this, this change in the way we see. I want to introduce two modern Jewish philosophers. The first one is the mid-20th century French Jewish philosopher, philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. And he taught what is sometimes called an ethic of the face. In essence, what he says is this. When you see the face of another, be it a human being or something else. When you see the face of another, when you see that other as a unique being, though not necessarily a separate being, but you see the other as a unique, unique other, unique being, you're inwardly commanded to treat that face, that other, with justice, compassion, and love. And he summarizes it sometimes by saying, when you see the face of another, you are commanded not to kill the other and not to harm the other. This, this command doesn't come from a God. It comes from the very act of seeing itself. Seeing commands you to be a blessing. Now, explaining that would just become very abstract. So really what we have to do is practice it and that's where I'm going eventually. But remember, this is not a command from the outside. It's an internal orientation that arises in you to treat the other with respect, coming from the very act of seeing that other uh, in its uniqueness. So let me tie that to Martin Buber, which is academics hate this. Scholars are very careful not to link Levinas' ethic of the face with the I thou philosophy teachings of or the I thou uh, dialectic philosophy, dialogic philosophy of the German Jewish contemporary of Levinas, Martin Buber. I'm not a scholar, and I'm not so careful. And I think it helps to actually link these two. For me, Buber offers a deepening of Levinas. Since for Buber, every face is not just the face of another, but the face of God, or the face of aliveness. Just as each wave, if in, engaged with deeply, will take you to the ocean, each face will take you to this aliveness, this non-dual aliveness manifesting as everything. In this way, Buber echoes the insight of perennial wisdom, that every life is a happening of this aliveness. And linking Levinas with Buber, I would say, is to see the face of the, to see in the face of the other. No, take that back. To see the face of the other, not in the face, not on the face, and I'm gonna come back to that. But to see the very face of the other as the face of God. And in this way to know each face, every, including your own face, as the face of God. And again, it's like seeing each wave, while unique and distinct, as still the waving of the single ocean. And this seeing, Allah loving us, this seeing alone, actually Allah loving us and Buber, this seeing alone is enough to call you 
inwardly, internally, not from the outside, <clears throat> to be a blessing. So is it possible to see the face of the other as the face of God? So I'm sticking within the Jewish frame. And the Jewish frame is confused because it says in the book of Exodus, whoever wrote the verse, you know, chapter 33, and this is in verse 20, whoever wrote it puts into the word, into the mouth of God, God's a character in the Bible, obviously, so that God says to Moses, you cannot see my face. No one can see my face and live. So it seems like it's impossible. Buber and Levinas are, are in contradiction to the Bible. I'm trying to say that they're not, and I'll show you why in a second. So we have this Exodus statement, you cannot see my face, says God, no one can see my face and live. Then you get the poet who wrote Psalm 27, and the poet rejects this idea, and in his verse, God commands the opposite. God commands us to, quote, seek my face. That's Psalm 27, verse 8. So which is it? So the Kabbalists, the mystics, try to reconcile what seems to be a paradox. And they resolve the paradox this way. Put the two verses together, they say, and this is what it says. Seek my face in every face. And when you see my face as every face, you cannot live as you did before you saw my face. Before you saw my face, you felt free to have dominion over the other. Genesis 1. But after you've seen my face, you can only engage the other with compassion and justice. You can only be a servant. Genesis 2. Okay, so hopefully this is making sense. And if not, I'm sure someone's going to tell me. So let's go to the practice piece, and I'll bring this to a close. Because the, I like these ideas. The ideas make sense to me. But ultimately, the question is, <clears throat> how do I do it? How do I see the face of the other and the face of God as the face of the other? So there are lots of ways to do it in Judaism. I'm just going to focus on one. It's, and certainly lots of ways in, different, in other traditions. But I'm going to focus on one. It's the Jewish practice called Shiviti, S-H-I-V-I-T-I, -I -I, Shiviti. The word means I place, and it comes from a verse in Psalm 16, uh, it comes from Psalm 16, verse 8, which says, Shiviti yod -Hey vav -Hey, right, the, the unnameable, lenegdi tamid, literally in English, I place the divine before me always. Since the name of God, yud heh vav -Hey, is literally unpronounceable, it's made of four consonants, and there's no vowels, there's no way to vocalize it, the rabbis from the very beginning offered euphemisms to say in its place. Most of them, or the most common one, is the Hebrew word Adonai, Lord, and that's why there's so much of, about Lord in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, but that's not, whenever you see the word capital L, Lord, referring to God, it's, it's a rabbinic uh, edit. It's not in the actual text. What's in the actual text is the four-letter Y-H-V-H, good hey, vav hey, which they can't pronounce, so they substitute with Adonai. But there are other substitutions which are much better. Adonai is masculine. Adonai is hierarchical. yud hey, vav hey is none of that. So I prefer to use this word chayut, aliveness. It comes from the 18th century Jewish mystic uh, Menachem Nachum Tversky, say that three times fast, Menachem Nachum Tversky, he was the, the Rebbe, the Jewish master of, uh, mist, you know, spiritual master of Chernobyl, long before there was a Chernobyl nuclear disaster. So when I recite the mantra, which I do every day as part of my daily practice, I recite it this way, Shiviti Chayut Lenegdi Tamid. Shiviti chayut lenegdi tamid. Shiviti, I place chayut aliveness lenegdi before me tamid always. But it's not perfect because we're talking about seeing. That's what I'm trying to do is to see you in a different way. But my mantra talks about placing the divine 
in front of me always. So how do you, how do you get from placing to seeing? So the way I was taught was this way. When you recite the Shiviti, you consciously place the lens of Mohin Dagadlu, the spacious mind, over the lens of Mohin Dagadlu, narrow mind. That you make this, this effort of, of imagination, I guess you could say, to deliberately s- try to see the other, to see the face of the other in such a way that it ultimately reveals the face of God. It's, it's vague because you can't really say, oh, I know the face of God has, you know, three eyes, or, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's not that kind of thing. It's, it's all metaphoric language. But you, you're making this, this conscious effort to look not beyond the narrow, you know, the, the, the unique face of the other. You want to see that face as it actually is and know that that face in its distinctiveness is also the non-dual face of God. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's the practice. And this is what, this is, you know, what we do with it. So to me, in a sense, it sounds like the Hindu practice of greeting another person with namaste, right? You know, namaste and you bow, which means I honor the divine that is you. Whenever you see another being, a human, an animal, a tree, whatever it happens to be, say to yourself, because this is the practice, whenever you see another being, say to yourself, Shiviti chayut lenegdi tamid. I place the divine before me always. I place aliveness before me always. So I'm not seeing the way uh, Einstein said in, in, the, in the optical delusion. I'm not seeing self and other. I'm placing the non-dual aliveness in front of me. And I'm looking through that lens and I'm seeing the other as this non-dual aliveness. So I think my experience is that over time, if you do this, and you can find other ways of doing it, but if you, if you do this, which is what I do, you'll come to see the other as the one. And you engage with the other in a manner aligned with being a blessing to all the families of the earth. While the specifics of being a blessing change from encounter to, co- to encounter, it's not a fixed thing, being a blessing. It arises out of that moment. The practice of Shiviti makes each encounter a holy opportunity for service, or you might say an opportunity for holy service. And in that way, bring a bit of light into the dark night surrounding us. So I'm going to stop there and hope that made some sense so that you all have something to say. I don't want to say in response, but, you know, to have a conversation around some of these ideas. Definitely. Thank you, Rami. Uh, and I, um, I'm hoping we can go without surprising you, go to FOR uh, first. And, and I'll ask a quick uh, question. I'd be curious to know your thoughts about. You mentioned going from chapter one to chapter two in Genesis. And I think you said there are two different writers. There's things like the I and the J writer or something like that. I think I came across the idea that the, the later writer writes more of a story. It's more of a storyteller and that the early writers are more of the seem to be more priestly in the way that they're writing. And I wonder if that might also be part of the shift in consciousness that we might contemplate a shift from the highly ordered, uh, as Campbell would describe a priest, somebody whose responsibility is to uphold the tradition as it has been versus a storyteller uh, who is coming at the world in, in maybe a, a, a different way. I don't know. I wonder if that, if that resonates with you uh, at all. And then I hope we can hear from Barbara. Yeah. So let me just, just say something about that uh, briefly. So yeah, there's, there's four different writers. We don't have to go into all of them. The, the oldest one is because it's called J. That's the second story. The first story is the priestly story that's called the P writer. And yeah, they're, they're different. They're different in their names for God. They're different in their orientations. And the priestly writers are concerned primarily with setting up a hierarchy, a male patri- you know, patriarchal hierarchy, because they're the hierarchy. The thing I want to add about the storytellers in the J tradition is, comes from uh, uh, Dr. Harold Bloom, Professor Harold Bloom from Yale, who's deceased now. 
But he wrote this amazing book that I would highly recommend. It's called The Book of J, just the letter J. And J is, uh, is uh, it's from the German because it, it's supposed to be the first letter of God's name, but there's no J in Hebrew, so it would be Y. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, he, he goes with the, the traditional scholarly Jehovah German uh, J. So it's called The Book of J, and he co-writes it with a poet Oh, his name just went out of my head. I think it's David Rosenberg, something like that. But in the book, he lays out this theory that the early stories of Jay, like the one I just uh, shared, that the early stories of Jay were written by women, that there was a literary class of, of women writers and readers who would write and, uh, for each other. It was like, it was a, I don't know, a subterranean. I, I don't want to, you know, turn them into a secret society because I don't know that's true, though I think it's a cool idea. But it was this group of women who wrote for one another and the male characters in their stories usually are idiots. And you can look at the early Genesis stories, even though they write them in a way that, that allows them to, to get the stories into the, the zeitgeist, into the worldview, by making the male the, the, the front character, if you read them carefully, you see that all the action is happening uh, behind the scenes by the women. And the men are simply props in a sense. So th there's this whole theory that these are, this is early, early feminist literature uh, satirizing the men in their lives. But you're right about making, make, well, I mean, I said this, making the shift from, from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, from the priestly worldview to the, the, the more metaphoric understanding of, of reality for, that you get from storytellers, myth makers. Okay, we gave Barbara a chance Thank to think you. of something yeah. <laughs> to say. <laughs> All of that was simply by way of giving you some time, Barbara. So thank you, Rami. You're, thank you're... You well. um, no, that's, that suits me fine. I, I like very much the idea that women wrote that. Um, I've, I'm also a priest in the Episcopal church who tells stories. So I recognize another duality between priests and storytellers. And, and I'm also, um, you know, uh, I learned the JPED theory of the Bible and it's a weave. One doesn't give way to the other. One doesn't go away. The, the, the weaving of those earliest stories, or at least um, the foundational ones, are layer upon layer. They don't argue with each other like some whole books of the Bible do, thank goodness, or it wouldn't be such a good library. Um, but I, um, at least in my own priestliness, have seen my job as a um, wooing the tradition to evolve through the confusion that narrative introduces because narrative always has uh, a twist in the plot that subverts the expected outcome. Um, so I'm not responding quite as much to um, your question, Will, as I am marveling at the way in which good narrative um, doesn't let anybody stay on top very long. It's, it's uh, flipping the narrative a lot, but, but I, but I love, um, Rami, that means in, in the Second Testament, a woman wrote the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples are idiots all the time. Jesus is always calling <laughs> yeah, them could, out about something. It, so, yeah. Absolutely could be. I mean, look, who, 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 is, who goes to, to, the, to, to the tomb? Not the guys. Uh, right? The guys are running away. So, yeah, the, the, it's the women. If you can read these books uh, with that kind of perspective and, and get a very different view. Sure. And, and I get the fact that you're an Episcopal priest and a storyteller, um, but there is something about priesthood that I find problematic. Um, so I'll tell you a quick story. I was with uh, Bishop Spong. Um, in, For anybody who doesn't know, he's a complete rabble rouser, was, God bless him. Yeah, right. Rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, we were in Western Mass in, in Holyoke, Massachusetts, at some, some Episcopal conference. And he gave this keynote talk on Friday night about the need to evolve the liturgy. And his example was the Lord's Prayer. And he says, it makes no sense. And he goes through, and I won't do it, because our Father, what do you mean our Father, who art in heaven, where's heaven? 
in, in an age of space travel, there's no up and down, there's no heaven, there's just in and out. And it goes through this whole thing. And it's, it was really inspiring and uplifting and people were moved and they got a standing ovation. The next morning, there's, no, oh, I'm sorry, that was Saturday night. Sunday morning, there's a service. So I go to the service and we get to the Lord's Prayer and the priests who are doing it, they just read the same you know, liturgy that they've always read. And then there was a you know, Q&A period afterwards. And I said, was anyone listening to Bishop Spawn? You know, he said, don't do that. And then he just did it. And they looked at each other and they said, you know, we didn't even think about it. Because the, the priest isn't invited to think as much as to uphold what's already been thought. I mean, I'm not picking on you specifically, obviously, but, but there's a danger, whether it's the, the Jewish priesthood or a Christian priesthood or, or any, any kind of priesthood, Brahmin you know, priesthood, that it's, it's frozen. And, and I think it creates systems that are fundamentally broken. I think you could say that about the guru system in general. It's fundamentally broken. It's all about maintaining power and control in a system that's no longer working, as opposed to the storyteller, the, the myth share, the myth maker, um, the spiritual, very spiritually creative individual, or maybe to say the spiritual creative, to say it like that, uh, who is about breaking the norm in order to experience the reality right in us, as us, around us. So I don't know where that came from, but... Thank you. you. Uh, Rami, thank you so much for that. You helped me understand why I'm here. I wasn't sure why I was here uh, in this panel, but your comments and your observations helped me uh, understand why I'm here. Um, what I love about Richard Rohr's work is that he refuses to put that kind of priestly garb on and preach to us. And so part of my morning meditation is to read one page from Yes and of Roars, uh, because he's reimagining um, Christianity, he's reimagining the Bible in really rich ways uh, that help me imagine. But here's where I am with what you said. Um, let me see if I can put two of these notions together. And uh, this first one was uh, provoked by your use of the word alignment. And it reminds me that Joseph Campbell would say, the primary function of a myth is to lead an individual to a place where he or she becomes transparent to transcendence. And I've always liked and rethink that um, that movement, that that is what myths uh, have as their purpose. So I'm thinking if we leaned on that just a little bit, to imagine the other as an image of this transcendence. In other words, to see the other in their own transparency that does um, uh, allow to emerge that transcendence. And I wanna tie that and then any response that you have or others, I would really love to hear it. You, you, you mentioned the word imagination just once, which, you know, terrific. I'm seeing this as um, a validation this talk and I think this panel, a uh, validation of the power of the imaginal. And to see the other as you've been describing it seems to allow each of us to participate in creation itself. And not that we're trying to be like God, but there's something in our humanness that has that divine impulse to participate in creating the world. And maybe we do it one person at a time by seeing them in their full transparency. So that's where I am right now. 
No, I'm, I love the idea of transparency. I'm, I'm not so sure I get the transcendence part. What, what troubles me about the idea of transcendence, and this is probably not what you mean at all, but what troubles me about the word itself is it sounds Gnostic. Like I'm trying to get away from, you know, I, I see you in your transparency, but does that erase your uniqueness? And, and does yeah. the transcendence take me beyond who you actually are? Because you're, you're already uniquely Dennis and also God, using the word God, you know, in, in a, in a non-anthropomorphic way, not in, in a yes. dualistic way. I don't want to lose the Dennis in that transparency. I want to be able to see yep. both and, yes. you know, yes. the, the divine and the human. I mean, just as we say that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, so is yes. Dennis. So is Bob. No, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm feeling in listening to you the um, healthy tension between the imminent and the transcendent. And I'm wondering if that, if that tension can't be held, because I'm completely with you. I don't want to slip into outer space with the transcendent as I'm trying to see the divine in your imminent presentness. Yeah. What if yeah. what you know, we need to trans what if what we need to transcend is what you were saying is the the illusion that we put inside ourselves. Yeah. Not transcending existence, but transcending our failed perception yeah our limits yeah. that's right yeah. you know I, I do a Thanks. lot of work i do a lot of work in 12-step recovery mm -hmm. uh and a lot of people write to me and are, are hung up on the idea of a higher power mm -hmm. and because it's so dualistic and if you look at the big book you know bill w's uh, book of yeah. alcoholics anonymous yep. he doesn't use higher power I mean, he was an atheist, and then he came up with this non-dual thing that someone told yeah. him you could, you know, use that. But he uses the term "greater," a power greater than ourselves, as opposed okay. to higher. So he loses that duality. He loses that hierarchical nice. notion. So, and I, what I like is the. No, that's why I like the Hindu notion of the ocean and the wave. The wave is is the ocean, though not all of the ocean. So it's. The ocean is greater than the wave, but it's not higher than the wave. I'm yeah. just trying to avoid yeah. the, That's great. The, you know, the, the, that, that dualistic sense. Yeah, thank you for that. Very helpful. I, can I add something? Is it, is it okay? Um, translating transcendence to in spiritual practice, for me, comes pretty close to detachment, the teachings of detachment in Buddhist and, and Christian practices of thinking of St. John of the Cross and others that um, I can see, I, as I'm talking to you, I can see um, barriers to connection come up <clears throat> in my thoughts, how I think about your face, how I think about what you say, how uh, it connects with some other opinion that I have and so on and so forth. What meditation has taught me is I can see the, the flow of otherness come through me and and to let go let go let go and just be with you be with you be with you feels like a kind of a a, a good way to understand transcendence because it, it's based in actual experience and uh, i'm also reminded rami of um <clears throat> uh, levinas who whose work i also like that um he he coined this word now in english alterity and what alterity means is the uh, is the appreciation of otherness, because otherness has really gotten a bad rap in this country, and rightly so because of the dualistic connotation. But I, I've noticed that you know I've been married for forty years, and um, one thing I started to notice maybe it was the pandemic. I don't know. Um, my wife Margaret's an Episcopal priest too, and she works on climate change full time. So we're always in that you know, the planetary world and also in our spiritual practice. Anyway, she, uh, uh, she, ha she has different habits than mine. She grew up in a very upper class environment. I grew up in a very working class, Northern Wisconsin environment in, in the bar business actually. So I learned some very different habits and she, uh, hers very different from mine. And I think for, for a lot, for many, almost decades, um, the differences were a problem for me. 
um, and I tried to transcend them to into this oneness thing. And I finally realized, no, that's like, that's wrong. Because I want to, appre- it, it came to me to appreciate how she's different from me. Yeah. And when I, st- when I began to appreciate how she's different, oh, that's the way you learned it. Oh, and I learned something different. And then a, a different kind of oneness arose in me to really appreciate that she's not me, <laughs> you know? So, um, because there is a danger if we push oneness too much of, um, uh, overextending it so that it, it becomes kind of narcissistic in a way. Um, yeah, well, I want to avoid I'm, erasing the other, right? It's to, see, yeah. it's to see self and other as equal manifestings of, of this divine. But in, in yeah. your practice, I'm, I'm, and, and it's, you know, we're using language, and that's not a good thing to do when we talk about practice, but we, I'm using words, so here we go. When you... And I like the way you put it, that you see the thoughts arising that separate. And then you said, oh, I should have written it down. I thought I'd remember, but I don't. Then you said, some, there's a voice sort of that says something. What did it say? The let it go or, or something? What did it say? Do you remember what you oh, said? It, the vo- there is no voice. It's just that the, with training, you know, I've been meditating a long time, is the, uh, as soon as my awareness notices the object of awareness, it dissolves. Ah, and I'm just okay. here, and I'm just here with you. That's all. Okay. Not knowing where it's going, and then it's the cloud of unknowing. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I, I missed her. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I had a similar experience today um, that you guys are talking about. So just to step back for a minute, for me, what I'm hearing is descriptions of levels of consciousness. It's not just cognitive understanding how we see people as like us or not like us. There are actual subjective experiences of stages that lead to the frameworks or the seeing, what you're calling seeing it differently, Rami, that that can be learned through spiritual practice. So for me, you know, my two lineages I'm a resistant Jew, Rami, you know that about me. My two lineages are depth psychology and Vedanta. And so today I was watching the um, January 6th hearings. And every once in a while I was crying and I was really feeling the dark night of our species, of our democracy. And the whole day was focused on Mike Pence. Now, for me, people who are literal Bible believers, people who are fundamentalist Christians or fundamentalist Jews or Muslims or any kind of fundamentalism are really challenging for me. And I I tend to other them because I'm so kind of I've been meditating for so long. I, I'm trained to think symbolically. I'm, I'm not a literal, concrete thinker. And so when they were talking about Mike Pence today as a hero, as an um, extremely ethical person who believes in the Bible and was praying throughout the whole insurrection, and who believes in the constitution. Um, I noticed, like you said, Jonas, my mind, I noticed these thoughts starting to happen, which, and so for me, it's about shadow work. I notice the thoughts, I notice I'm being triggered. I begin to let them go. And as that, and I know what, you know, I know what my triggers are with fundamentalist believers and What happened was, for the first time for me, I saw Mike Pence as aliveness, as divine, as a soul on a journey. My language now is role to soul. It's not just for myself. It's for everyone. It's it's how I'm building relationships and seeing and attempting to see people and attempting to cultivate that level of awareness. And for the first time, my heart opened to Mike Pence. And I felt this gratitude and the beauty 
of his level of consciousness, which is, and his, his reality, which is extremely different from mine as two human beings. And I felt, um, and the otherness dissolved. And it was just a beautiful moment in the context of what you're talking about. And I could see the beauty and the divinity in what I previously saw as problematic and other. So I, I don't need to comment on everything you know, everyone says, I guess, but, but maybe you're, you're triggering me. So I get the, the idea, and, and, I, and I think the next step then is to feel the same about John Eastman and then to feel yeah. the same about, about, about Donald Trump. Well, but, I'm not there yet. <laughs> no, I didn't say, <laughs> I'm certainly not there. But I want to make it clear, at least for me, that opening my heart and seeing the aliveness that is happening as Mike Pence doesn't erase the fact that Mike Pence would be the worst president after Donald Trump That's right. to, to take over this country. I think we have to see um, th there's both. A, 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 yeah. both and, right? Yeah. I mean, you, have to, you have to see the uniqueness of it and, and not be able to imagine the evil. I'm not saying Mike Pence is evil, but, but there are evil people, I think, in the world to imagine the evil away to say, oh, it's all love, it's because it's all God. But God is not all love. God is reality, and it contains everything. So, so that, that's my only concern. Is that, spiritual yeah. reductionism. I call that spiritual reduction. Yeah. Yeah, right. You wanna, we want to avoid that. So thank you, Mike Pence, for doing the right thing. And Once. please <laughs> don't be president. Yeah. And yeah, please don't be president. <laughs> I think about it kind of compensatorily, right? It's like, we definitely, it's kind of like, uh, uh, what is the primary mode? You know, that it's, it's like, we need to work more on seeing through to the divinity, to the non-otherness of things. I'm going to see the otherness. I'm going to wake up and see the otherness immediately. That's going to happen. So if I can just work on the thing that I don't do naturally, you know, I can maybe even edge slightly away. Um, Gary, Ed, we haven't heard so, from y'all so yet. So, Will, Will uh, let me jump in and, yeah. and ask Please. that we go to Ed, because I'd like yeah. Ed to talk to this from the Zochen perspective, um, if, if you would, um, which I think speaks to this both and kind of thing. Well, I would speak from, say, a Madhyamaka perspective. Okay. Hit, hit us with uh, some Nargarjuna, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the verses of, uh, of uh, Nargarjuna. But, I, you know, there's several thoughts that I'm not going to very articulately weave together. One thought is that we are epistemolo epistemologically wired to regard an external object of our perception as existing independently of us, of us as a perceiver. We are epistemologically wired to think that the subject is also independent, that they both have an inherent reality, they truly exist as non-interdependent entities. And that just happens in that first moment of perception. We see it. It enters into our eyeballs, goes into the brain, creates a category, and it does all of that. But we don't realize in the process that we are subjectively applying this condition through which they exist, which is independent of us. So all the qualities that they appear to have are not qualities that we are imposing on them, but qualities that they have inherently in and of themselves. So when we look at Pence or Trump or whatever, we're looking at them uh, in sort of that way. But so. In Buddhism, they talk a lot about anatma, right, non-self. They don't mean that people don't exist or don't have some sort of individuation as a way of being, but it's more like how do we exist? Not the whether we exist, it's how we exist. And so we exist as interdependent beings and our interdependency uh, includes us and everything that we're perceiving and everything around us. 
So it also ties into the notion of the, 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 what is the absolute truth? Well, shunyata, you know, it's emptiness. Things are empty of existing inherently in and of themselves. Then there's also a conventional reality called Savritti Satya, you know, in, in Sanskrit, which is a conventional reality. So our conventional reality is that that person exists independently, the way they appear, and we are different. We otherize just by the nature of our way of perception, by the way of our karma, the way of our, 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 our the, all, the way in which we've been conditioned. So the great, the great, um, it's like you were saying, in bringing together the God and the and the face of God, and how do you how do you bring these two together? Together in a non-dual sort of sense. So, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, you're seeing, you're trying to bring together your understanding of interdependence and that things are empty of inherent ex- of, of reality with your conventional view that they do exist independently, because that's and bring them as close as possible into the pres- into the, into a single moment. So the process of enlightenment is that sort of narrowing of that gap. So when you be, when you become a high, you know, a bodhisattva out of a high level or a Buddha, that, that you are seeing people at the same time as being uh, uh, conventionally existing with the qualities that they appear to have, but also it, empty of inherently existing. So the idea, just like what you were trying to, what you were explaining, you know, when it came to the, to the Hebrew tradition, uh, Buddhism has that same dilemma because you're trying to unite in a non-dual way the conventional with the absolute to see them so, simultaneously. So you started out, in a sense, uh, explaining what, what Einstein was saying, that this optical delusion of dualistic consciousness, it's biological, right? I mean, you were talking about being conditioned, but we're conditioned by our biology to see things as self and other in, in the way you described it so so well. And this isn't just to you, it could be you know, to anybody uh, who's engaged in contemplative practice. My sense is that you can be aware of the biological dualism, uh, honor it, I guess you could say, be aware of it and be aware of be aware of it from a more spacious stance, spacious mm-hmm. something, you know, that Judaism say spacious mind, but, um, but you can view what, everything that's happening from that spaciousness and still, and see and honor and work with um, the dualistic at the same, at the same time. Is that, I mean, that's sort of how I understand the whole Dzogchen Ati yoga enterprise. Yeah, I think that that ends up being whether it's Dzogchen or Mahamudra or whatever yeah. the traditions are. That's basically the goal: is that you bring together the conventional with the absolute. You're able to in one in one moment of perception that they both exist simultaneously. It doesn't negate the other one. It doesn't drive the other one out of existence. You're you are automatically perceiving the way it exists. It exists interdependently with you as a perceiver, interdependently with the environment that surrounds it and creates it interdependently. So you become part of a interdependent whole, mutually uh, mutually joined in that kind of oneness, so to speak, with each other. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and the, the uh, for Christians, being created in the image and likeness is, uh, uh, it's about the Trinity the Holy Trinity, so that there is this flow of selfing, othering, wanting simultaneously. Um, And so God is one and God is three. And we have this um, paradoxical understanding of ultimate reality. And that is who we are. We're created in the image and likeness of this one and three. And for me, um, the practice that goes with that is the the aliveness of the first person is the mystery, the great mystery that there, there are no, as Rami, as you're saying, there's no words that can, um, that can honor um, the sacred mystery. And the second, what Christ, we Christians call the second person 
is the manifestation of um, Jesus said, I'm in you and you're in me in, in John 14. Um, I'm in you and I'm in you, in you, you're in me. We are in God. And um, Irojana, a uh, 9th century, 10th century Celtic theologian said that we are created from inside God. I think this really fits, Rami, with what you're saying. We're not created separate from God. We're created from inside God. So everything that happens uh, for us in this life with uh, people and nature is uh, transparent. I, I love that word personally, transparent to divine reality. And the, the third person for Christians is this this uh, sacred ru ru ruah. Ruah? Yeah, ruah. ruah. Yeah. yeah, right there where the Big Bang happened, that there's this breath of new life um, flowing across the newness of something that's never existed before. So for us, the, the, and when we talk about the Trinity and being in the image and like to so the, the first person is, is um, every moment, every moment, awakening, being new, letting go of the past and so on and so forth, because we're walking into the cloud of unknowing. And the second person is really essentially friendship. I mean, what Jesus came to before he knew he was going to be executed with his friends is said, I, I, I no longer call you my disciples in a sense. You're not my servant, you're my, you're my friends. So that, that I thou comes down to this very specific embodied relationship that I love you, you're my friend. And um, it's always struck me that uh, Jesus said, do you love me? And uh, I can't remember, I, I'm not a Buddhist scholar, but I don't think Buddha said that. Um, what is that about? That there's something sacred about interpersonal love, the interpersonal uh, dimension of love. Um, that is so important that it's divine. Um, and then the third being the spirit, Hagios Penuma uh, Ruach, new life in the in the spirit. I just, well, <laughs> okay, for those who just came on, I have to say, <laughs> that's what my new book is about. <laughs> so, sorry, the marketing moment. <laughs> this whole book is about the practices of those three dimensions. We'll be back after this word from... <laughs> Jonas, get the commercial in there. You know, <laughs> yes. I, I just, I just want to say to that 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 Buddha doesn't have to say, you know, do you love me? Mm -hmm. Not because he's Buddha, but he doesn't have to say that. Just the way Jesus doesn't have to mimic Krishna, or, or because we humans are heir to the entire the entirety of these systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what. I think that's what you know myth salon is all about that that these are my stories the christian story and there may be people who call themselves christians who own who pretend to own that story but they are usually the ones who don't get the story and the same thing in Jewish jewish side the ones who claim ownership are the ones who are the least open to what it really has to say but yeah. the genius of of I don't know if you want to say postmodernity, maybe that's too loaded, but the genius of, of our time is that we, we realize these are all human creations. They're all fingers pointing you know, to, to the moon and that we are heir to the entire system. So that, um, you, know, where's, you know, where's the Jewish Buddha? I don't need a Jewish Buddha. I need Buddha. I don't you know, where's the Jewish Krishna? I don't need the Jewish Krishna. I need Krishna. So we can put all of these and learn from all of them. <clears throat> and they don't have to say the same things, but ultimately they point in the same direction, I think. So I, I, that's what makes our time so unique and, and why I'm so disappointed in it, because it should be uh, coming, you know, it shouldn't be the dark night that it is, but maybe it's necessary to cloud of unknowing kind of thing. So, Will, there was someone who hadn't, hasn't said yeah, anything? Yeah, we haven't heard from Gary yet. I would love to. All righty. I'll, I'll keep it quick. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, when you were talking about aliveness, uh, I was reminded of, I don't know if it was Campbell or someone had asked him in the 60s, um, you know, about God. And, and he was talking about aliveness. And he said, where do you see this aliveness today? And he said, the Beatles. Um, 
you know, that, that embodiedness uh, of aliveness and that, you know, I like that you located that alienating move in Yahweh, in us. So there's a struggle between the alienating and the, and the move to aliveness in us. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a, a beautiful thing to talk about. It's, it's something that we're trying to, to find uh, uh, in these different ways and coming back to the body and, and, and celebrating and finding uh, joy and happiness, you know, especially difficult uh, right now, but uh, still the urge, you know, is there in us. So thank you. So, yeah, this is, this is really an interesting discussion, it seems to me. I, I don't know if this is okay, Dana. Will, I want, can I introduce a new element that's just sort of... Yes. No, well, not a new idea. I don't, I don't, I've never had a new idea. <laughs> I've come across some other idea I've never heard of. It's new to me, but not necessarily a new idea. But one of the hallmarks, I think, not, or, or maybe it's actually a hallmark of the Dark Knight, think Kali Yuga kind of thing. One of the hallmarks of this moment of disintegration is the collapse, and it's gonna, it collapses violently with a lot of anger and a lot of violence of, of the patriarchy. And the, one of the signs of that, I think, and for me personally, it's true, but I, I think this is also on a more global mythic level, the return of the divine mother, the return of the, of the divine feminine. So in, in Judaism, of course, there's no such thing as Judaism, like, like Hinduism, there's Hinduisms, there's Judaisms. But in the wisdom tradition of Judaism, there's the, um, I, I don't know if, if we could make it a trinity, but it's probably unnecessary to do that. But there's, there's this, the ground of being that is the ineffable aliveness and it manifests and the process by which it manifests is called uh, is called um, chachma, which in the Kabbalistic system is means one thing, but in the book of Proverbs, chachma is, is the first manifesting of the deity. So first, there's just God. In the Bible, it says, Ain ode mil vado. There's nothing other than this aliveness. And then from out of this aliveness, first, before we get the, the world that you and I know, comes the divine mother called Chachma. And then she is the builder of the universe. Um, that, I mean, that literally is that in eight Proverbs 8, 22 and following. She says uh, that, that um, now I'm playing, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, paraphrase. God's like the architect who gives her the plan, and then she she you know actually manifests the she creates the universe, and the return of the divine feminine is a return to a, a deep sense of of nature, and because what we've done is we sort of, um, and it's all you know psychological, but we we've made this split. And the masculine is the transcendent and the feminine is the imminent. And that's probably all BS. But there is this return of the divine mother. And my experience of her is uh, palpable. I mean, I've, I've seen, I'm not saying she looks a specific way, but I've seen her in different forms. And I've heard her in different, in different forms. In Judaism, it's called a bat kol, the daughter's voice, which is, in the, in the rabbinic tradition, when God speaks to humans, what humans hear is the bot call, the, the daughter's voice. How this patriarchal rabbinic society decided that God speaks as a woman and not as Charlton Heston, I don't know, but I'm, I'm happy to, to have that in my tradition. And so I've heard this, this feminine daughter, this daughter's voice. And what I'm learning from those experiences is that Ours is a time of, to shift from dark night to, to a different Christian trope, it's, it's a time of, of, of crucifixion. And this is the work of the mother, like Kali. This is a, a, the work of the mother who is stripping us of everything we think we know. And I think in this sense, Christian, the Christian story, the Christian myth is maybe the most powerful in, in, in the following sense. 
you look at the first gospel chronologically, not in the book. The first gospel is Mark, not Matthew. So in Mark's gospel, the only thing Jesus says on the cross, if I know the gospel correctly, the only thing Jesus says on the cross is, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I read that, I hear the emphasis on my God the God of my imagination, the God of my understanding is the way they put it in 12 step, the God that I want to be true, the God that's my guy, you know, the God that's going to you know, save me. You know, even if I have to drink this cup, I'm going to get up on the cross. And there's this Gnostic gospel that, that depicts the crucifixion with uh, the body of Jesus on the cross and the spirit of Jesus hovering over the cross so Jesus feels no pain. And then this greater Christ consciousness laughing hysterically at the drama below. I think that's Gnostic nonsense. I, the Jesus I like is the Jesus who on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think we, we are, hopefully, we are at a point where humanity says, my God, my God, or our gods, our gods, why have you forsaken us? The gods that give us the organized patriarchal religions that have poisoned us for so, so many millennia, that those gods are, are not there to save us from the crucifixion, and that we're going to die on the cross not knowing, right, without salvation, without any exit, you know, like uh, Pema Chodron talks about no exit, different than Sartre's no exit. But still, we, the, the, the human situation is one where we're dying on the cross of our own hubris, ignorance, arrogance, fear, all of that. And that we die as we lose our God. And then if, if, we, if the myth is true, if the myth is accurate, we are raised into a new God consciousness. The old gods are gone. The new God, and, and probably the word wouldn't be God anymore, but the new consciousness arises, moving from, you know, uh, from Einstein's uh, optical delusion of, of dualistic consciousness to something else. And that the whole of humanity, or at least of Western humanity, or industrialized humanity, or militarized humanity, is, is going through this. And the hope is that we die. And, and that's what the mother holds out this hope that I'm going to, this is what she said to me once, and I, I literally want to take it, but this is what I heard. She said, Rami, I'm going to strip you naked of everything you know. And it's going to be a harrowing, horrifying experience. But at the other end, there is this new birth. And I think that's what's happening to us globally as a species. And I hope that's what's happening to us globally as a species. And it's going to be awful, but it's going to be ultimately um, transformative. And I, and I think the sign of that transformation is in our dreams, in our recovering ancient stories and, and myths. In, in Judaism, she's making a comeback. Shechina, Chachma, the whole divine feminine, is, is becoming more... Uh, you know, up in, at the front of, of what's going on spiritually in Judaism. I see that as a sign that there is hope at the end of this dark night. I'm just curious if, if any of you are having similar experiences or, or have a clue about what I'm saying. Well, I'd actually say that beyond that, I mean, we've had so many people come into this myth salon and have conversations. And I would actually say it's, it's been a theme. Uh, to some extent. And it's been a theme. And I think I would suspect many of our personal private conversations, you know, and when I can say that the proudest moment for me as a teacher was probably right after COVID, right? The student, students were gone for spring break. Everything gets shut down. Oh, by the way, don't come back from spring break. Let's be online. And those first conversations we're having where everybody else is in crisis. My students, they go to an art school. They've been taught hero's journey and individuation and narrative structure, how to see uh, processes of transformation in the narratives that they work. And so they immediately recognized it as a dark night. They immediately recognized this as the death that comes before the transformation that they're otherwise already knew was coming and already felt coming. 
And so this just looked like, and, and I can tell you, it was probably a little bit harder to hold on to that faith year, two, three years into it, but that was their immediate reaction. And the thing it makes me think about the most is Mercha Eliada. Um, and he's writing on uh, the, the eternal return. And he's trying to say that, you know, whether it's Christianity, where Christianity is divorced the death and resurrection of Jesus from nature because it's a transcendence focused religion about getting out of here. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> where uh, this is, this still has the motifs of the wine and the wheat that you see in the Egyptian and the other traditions where this death and resurrection is deeply grounded in the trans in the seasons and the solar cycle and the lunar cycle and all these natural cycles. But what he's saying is that in all of them, in all the new year ceremonies, which are repetitions of the creation myths in whatever culture that is, they repeat their creation myths in their renewals, in their new years, that you always see on the way down, the extinguishing, going towards nirvana, going towards the extinguishing. Uh, you always see the casting out of demons, the getting rid of sins, the all lang signs, all the, the, all the old stuff dying. And so I think Eliada kind of nails it. He's like, look at cycle after cycle, renewal after renewal, whether we're talking about, you know, solar journeys or seasonal journeys, this myth, that, uh, this is one of the standard phases as you approach that dark night of the soul is out with the old. So, so are you seeing in your students, are they having experiences of the divine mother, the divine feminine? Because you, you went through that. It was beautiful. A third and round grant feminine. with a group. Uh, what we, we offer the students grants to, to do. We don't pick the shows. They pick the shows. They come up with ideas. And so they did a show this year called Femme Fatale where they went through every decade uh, of the last century with different dancing styles and then telling the history of rising femininity. And they did by the same, by the way, the same thing once on this island. And so they, they're hitting all these key themes around rising feminine, uh, rising minority voices, uh, uh, recentering uh, the marginal, um, marginalized. Uh, so absolutely, they're, they're like, and the other big shift is Nobody wants to be a dentist or they all want to work on climate change or gay rights or whatever it is. They, the way that they identify and orient their, their dreams of their future is at this point more and more and more around the cause that they care about than the profession that they want. Well, talk somebody into being a dentist because I, I know. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I want to take it to just a more, little more personal level for me. Um, uh, growing up in an alcoholic home, father leaving, feeling shame about not having a father, uh, all that stuff that I went through <clears throat> and the recovery for me as a Christian was that I trusted that there was this presence um, that my grandmother taught me, ich bin klein, mein ist rein, niemand im Wohnen aus Jesus allein. I'm small, I'm pure, no one lives in my heart but Jesus alone. And that came through to me um, even in those moments when uh, my parents came home at two o'clock in the morning and they're shouting and pushing each other against the walls. And my mother has broken teeth the next day. And, you know, and then later in life, I, um, we lost our daughter, Rebecca. She died in our arms in a Boston hospital. And I can still remember it, how incredible that was to, to watch her go gray. And uh, I loved her. I loved her. We sang to her when she was inside of Margaret and, and she was she was dead and um then she was cremated and i uh, was driving up along the north shore and uh the black clouds were scudding across the ocean and and um i was weeping and i knew she was being cremated at that time and somehow i foray's requiem came to me and the music of foray's requiem just really you know awakened my soul that there is a life beyond death I missed her so much that I was imagining committing suicide. Um, but th this music um, awakened me that that death is not the end, um, you know, in that very personal way. And the, uh, the final story, just a quick one, is that I was diagnosed with a very serious prostate cancer eight years ago, and I had Gleason 9 out of 10. Um, and so I was facing death and uh, three months of radiation. I'm on the table at uh, Beth Israel in 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 Boston and um, every day, uh, every day for three months. And um, the, the mantra that came to me is burn away everything that is not love, burn away everything that is not love. And so there was, it was like, um, I, I guess I was thinking of Choi Trungpa saying, 
you know, the bad news is that we're falling, but the good news is that there's no bottom. Um, but, but for me as a Christian, um, the bottom is invisible, ineffable love. Um, and that, that's where I, I stand, if you will. If there's, um, that's my ground, which is no ground, <laughs> I guess you'd say. Uh, so the, yeah, yeah, the personal turn of, in tragedy, in the midst of life and death, tragedy and fear and the danger, um, wow, that's a, um, that's a beautiful thing if one has a, a path to be able to receive that, you know. Can you just tell me the name of the Requiem? Who's the composer? Four uh, A uh, F A U R uh, E with that, that little accent over yeah. the E. Yeah, I, I learned a Four A's Requiem, and uh, there's a section, a part of it called P A Yesu um, uh, to, to Jesus, and I um, I was doing a, a Shakachi tour some years ago with some Celtic singers, and Jocelyn Hamill and I, who's a Scottish singer we decided we we're going to do P. E. So I, I learned how to play P. E. on the Shakachi and she sang it and it was just so beautiful. Um, and it, there's a good chance that nobody else has played that on Shakachi, but it, you know, it just, um, there is a presence that comes to us in death, I believe. And we can have presages of this experience coming to us in death. I am with you. Like Rami, you know it better than I do, but I, I think throughout scripture, God is saying, yeah, it's going to be tough, but I, be, I will be with you. That, that phrase, I, I am with you, I will be with you, is so important. You've, you've excited Judith Breyer. She's very, very excited that you mentioned that part of the Requiem. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, great. Another, another vote for uh, <laughs> it's beautiful for his Requiem. I'm going to have to get a copy and listen to that. Yeah. Rami, you know, the thing that strikes me is the way in which originally coming up with language or as we form language, it becomes patriarchal if it holds to a linear relationship to what we wish to communicate rather than becoming a process. And as language becomes patriarchal, people who use the language become patriarchal. And it separates us from the natural world. It separates us from other, other beings because the way I use a word in a definitive sort of way <coughs> limits what it is that we can communicate or feel. And it strikes me that this is something we want to figure out ways of growing past, transforming, transcending, and not letting language form these kinds of cages that, that marginalize other people, marginalize um, different races, those who can't speak with precision or eloquence or analogy or metaphor are kind of left out in the dark. And it seems to me that when language serves consciousness, languages can release consciousness from the cages that they originally created. You know, and I, 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 think, I think you're right. I think there's lots of contemplative practices that move us beyond language. I'm sure many of us have had experiences of, of direct seeing without any, any thought intervening. Um, but there's, I can't remember the guy's name. Ugh. But anyway, there, there are practices to use language to deconstruct language. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can either come at it by, by trying to move beyond language and, and having that experience that's language free. <clears throat> and then there's the working with language in such a way as to deconstruct it. Judy, Jewish mysticism, I mean, Judaism is obsessed with words. I mean, our, in, in, in our basic myth, I mean, in Genesis one, God creates the universe through language. The word abracadabra is, is Hebrew, it means I speak and the thing happens. 
in, in fact, the word for speak and the word for thing in Hebrew are the same, same root. So we're obsessed with language. And yet we know that language is never the thing itself. So we have a lot of practices where we deconstruct the story, but you can also deconstruct the language itself. Just, you know, and, and usually it's done through what's called gematria, which is numerology. But in Hebrew, every Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent. So every Hebrew word has an, is an arithmetic sum. And the rabbis teach how to work with the, the text as math. And they say, if you have words with the same uh, uh, mathematics or arithmetic sum, those words can be understood as synonyms. So just one quick example, the word for a snake, nachash, has the same number as the word for 356, as the word for Mashiach, Messiah. And so they say the snake in the Garden of Eden story is really the Messiah. And the word um, Elohim, God, has the same number 86 as um, uh, uh, nature, Hateva. And so they say, well, when we talks about God, we're really talking about nature, which is like Spinoza, uh, Deus, uh, what is it, Deus sive natura, you know, God or, God or nature. So there's ways, if, if you're like me, if you're language obsessed and you love words, there's ways to working with the ways of working with the language that can destruct the, deconstruct the language to allow you to get beyond it. And the, these flashes come through the language, but not in a linguistic form, but you haven't had to toss it out, um, which for some people is something they want to do. And for some people, it's something they, they don't or can't do. Well, I just put a note out to people. I, I'm still stuck way back on the black, black Madonna and the divine feminine the pitch. I wrote a book called Learning to Walk in the Dark, and it was amazing to travel with that book and realize that by darkness or dark night of the soul, people meant depression, abandonment, mm -hmm. destruction, annihilation. And when I look at a book titled Longing for Darkness and the ways in which to learn to walk in the dark is to to walk into a different kind of beauty, to walk into um, a, a level of light in which dialogue and lovemaking and all kinds of things are more possible than they are when we are literally blinded by the light. So I somehow in this conversation want mythologically to rescue darkness. It's not always the synonym or the grab bag for what is to be gone through horribly in order to come back into the light, that there no. is a longing for darkness. No, and no. I mean, darkness is, is, is fertile, right? You, you know, dark earth, you know, that, that, it's, it's the fertile earth. <clears throat> I spent 10 days once, which is not a long time, but I spent 10 days once with the Black Madonna at Chart and, you know, walking the labyrinth and then going underneath where the Black Madonna was because someone cleaned her up <laughs> and they took all the all the black out but um meditating with the the black mother the dark mother is it, it's it's just what you're saying it's not depressive it's it's somehow um i mean you're enveloped in that darkness but the darkness itself is comforting I don't know. I don't. The language escapes me. But yeah, I really appreciate that. I'm glad you brought that up. That we're not. We're not. I mean, there's so many religions that are just about light and love. You can go to some New Age groups or or New Thought groups, where I always wonder. I, I always worry that people are going to have a diabetic go into to sugar coma. You know, from all the sweetness of the service. There, there's a place for darkness. And again, that's why I think the crucifixion is such a powerful story. Um, so anyway, yeah, I thank you for that. That that's really important. Um, just to keep that going, just add to that. Should I go? Yeah, yeah. Um, someone who probably both of you might know, and Belford Ulanov. Um, Jungian analyst from New York says, today God is down into matter and into what matters. 
And uh, I think that's certainly what we're talking about. Well, that matter thing is something I keep thinking about as well. You know, uh, matter, of course, obsessed with words. And I've said it too many times, but matter the latin word for both mother and and matter and i think that you know we talk about that shift in in consciousness i think it's not just as ed was saying that our senses tell us immediately that we're separate it's that as long as we live in a paradigm of atomism and material especially reductive atomistic materialism we're reinforcing with our worldview the fact that we see things as separate immediately And the Enlightenment was so successful at finally breaking us free of religion's dominance and higher and and monarchical dominance with finally a a union of common sense experience and science that both said the same thing. Everything is objectified and separate, etc. And of course, we're still in that hangover. And it was powerful in its ability to separate us and separate the individual from all that had chains on it before then. But uh, I think that there's this this convergence we have to break up, and that's what we're seeing when we talk about the shift in consciousness. When you see, you know, all the liberal positions against the conservative positions are still reductive materialistic positions. A woman's a woman because her body is a woman's body. I'm not disagreeing, but I'm saying we're still using a reductive materialism as our liberal response, and I think that that is that itself the liberal position being an enlightenment liberalism is is still buried in there and it's still reinforcing the common sense perspective of everything is separated from everything else particle is almost the same word as patriarchy will how do we get beyond that yeah that's what i was going to ask will how do you get beyond that einstein he did it not only did einstein prove the existence of an atom once and for all you know, he was the guy who used Brownian motion, you know, to make sense of atomism and say, here, atoms are real. But he also introduced this idea of the quanta. And the quanta is a particle and a wave fundamentally. And so we shift the foundation of our reality from a foundation of particles to a foundation of particle wave duality. And then we go to that Hindu perspective where waves in the ocean. But the thing is, the question is, are we talking about the ocean in terms of the stuff? Are we talking about the ocean in terms or is the wave the material wave? Or is it the shape of the wave? And if you shift from the material wave to the shape and you shift from ocean as stuff to ocean as field of waves, now you've shifted. I had a conversation with Cornell West at the American Academy of Religions Conference in Baltimore. And it was exactly about not losing the individual to the collective and the value of the wave in the field is that I can have a microphone in the middle of of a million musical instruments and we all play a million notes, but that microphone will record a single wave. It will travel as a single wave down the wire and be played by a single cone speaker as a single vibration. So waves, unlike material things, waves don't suffer the problem of one and manyness. For a wave, superposition is immediately no problem. And so our problem is that we've been so stuck in particle-based, materialistic-based, objective, seeing everything as objects that we haven't recognized that if we just drink the elixirs that are offered in most of these traditions, elixirs, why elixirs? Why fluids? Why magic fluids? It's not the stuff. It's the shape. It's the waves. Because waves are a metaphor. It's a pattern. It's a structure that has no problem with one in manyness. And so I think that for me, that's the shift is, is we just have to catch up our collective attitude to our collective science. We have to integrate the wave into the particle in the way that it translates into our deeper obsessions with, with particles you know, beyond science. Uh, Will, I have a question. Uh, I, I get the intellectual story you're telling there. How do you, I've got a question for you personally. How do you live that with, mm. with people? How, how do you live it? Uh, unfortunately, I think the answer is you have to die. It. <laughs> you know, it's, it, is, it is the dying of the ego. It is the dying of that. Of the, I think the, the atom reinforces the ego. They're the same structure. So if you believe in atoms, you're going to believe in egos. You're, you're going to project them on each other. And so the ego death and the atom death, they coincide. And the other thing, how do you really live it? How's our culture live? It? Well, if I had to open a door, I used to have to physically push it. If I wanted to, you know, listen to, if I wanted to be with some art, I had to physically be with it. And, you know, then if I needed money, I needed something physical. The materiality of our existence has evaporated and hollowed out into an immaterial existence. My phone, my Apple is not a material thing I eat. It is now a thing that 
is a very little material value, but it floats on a sea of waves and it's connected with everything all the time. So the point is my technology isn't conditioning me like it has for thousands and gajillions of years to tell me I'm separate material. Now my technology is conditioning me to tell me that there is reality of immateriality, that there wait, is a reality. Wait, wait, of wait. Waves. Will, you're telling me the technology is not conditioning us? I'm saying it is. I'm saying that the technology has changed. And instead of conditioning us to believe that we are, that everything is material based on a materialistic based technology. Now my technology is based on waves and immateriality. So now the technology gives me an immaterial existence. I watch movies without any matter and I, uh, everything floats. Have in you been on way. Twitter lately? Do you go on social media? I, I mean, it's, well, I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but it still suffers from the human uh, I don't know what you want to call it, disease of, of tribalism. I mean, it's all us against them in social media. Sure. Oh, I don't think that I'm not saying that, you know, we figured out how to how to not use guns yet. You know, but I think that. The, but the point is, is that at the very foundation of our technology, we haven't caught up. We have not caught up to our own science morally. We've not caught up to our own science creatively. But that science killed the imagination. This is when Tolkien said fairy tales are relegated to the nursery to die. And Breton said that, you know, anything that's irrational is, is seen as wrong and, and we're in a prison of rationality. The imagination was killed by the Enlightenment. And now that you have uh, a new foundation of existence in science where, you know, it's not that quantum mechanics says there's a God, but it doesn't say everything's separated the same way that it was definitively saying everything is separated anymore. So now that you have a new scientific foundation, and you have a new technological foundation, eventually we might someday, it might ripple upwards and we might actually vibrate in a way that expresses our change in our core code. The core code will work its way up and it is, and I think it's what we're seeing. Can I just make a comment? <clears throat> this is all very, very interesting, but we're, we're, we've kind of left the topic of darkness. And um, I've just finished a quarter teaching undergrads, mindfulness and Buddhism. And everybody in my class was suffering. All these young people. I couldn't, I mean, I, the stories were so heartbreaking. And here we are, this is Santa Barbara, you know, this is not, but the, the uh, so they're experiencing a darkness. It's not quite the dark night of the soul, but, but it's, it's a darkness. So the question is, to me, is how do how do we how do we treat that as a gift? How do we treat that as an opportunity? How do we? But you cannot say to a woman who just lost her baby, you know, be grateful, you know, work with this as a gift. So how is it that we can, you know, now just on a real everyday situation, work with the darkness and help ourselves and help other people work through it so that dynamically it can create a, a new a new light, a new opening. And, you know, this is still, I couldn't have taught this in my class, but, you know, in the tantric traditions of Buddhism, you know, the first of the Four Noble Truths is the truth of suffering. So when we are actually in that state, when we actually realize that that's the kind of the baseline of our reality, you know, because of our physical nature, because of the way we're wired, everything else, we're just bound to, you know, it's just bound to happen. So how do we work with that? And so when you come to the Tantra, you're working with all these material elements that make you up. You're working with your desires, you're working with your anger, you're working with and, tra and transforming them spiritually into a higher dimensionality where you are then reinventing yourself. You're becoming an enlightened being, but using the stuff that we're dealing with every day. It's tricky business. But it seems to be, you know, I, I think it's a theme. I'm not going to try to monopolize it now, but it is a theme that I think all the great traditions deal with in their own way. Is there, is there a practice in this? I mean, Tonglen or something? Is there something practical that can do? Well, Tonglen is a practice that's useful. Yeah, it's like, um, it's like really exchanging oneself and others is trying to to uh, imagine that the suffering of somebody else and meditating that you the capacity that you have to heal or to be a healing power or healing force through your compassion. So 
the compassion practice is at the basis of it. All of it is founded on compassion and love. But then it becomes a matter of technique. Well, how are you going to then to work with it? So I think, you know, this is a might be an interesting topic um, just for how do these how do different traditions teach us to work with with the darkness with the sorrow so that it becomes an opportunity for the, what you're talking about rami we're in a dark age now how is it that we can work with that you know without denying it without damning it without hating the enemy to it how can we work with it to create the new age you know within ourselves and between ourselves so that we can exemplify a way in which the world might live in the future. So I think it's, uh, how do we work with that? So um, that's all. Yeah. Ed, yeah. Ed, thank you for, for bringing that up. The, the word that's been haunting me for the last hour and a half is ritual. And maybe ritual is synonymous with uh, practice. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But with this new vision that has been the thesis for tonight. Um, what way can the body be implicated in new rituals to carry this new imagination uh, incarnately into the world on, on an everyday basis? So that's that's been my thought for the last at least the last hour and uh, so from the from the vision to the embodied um, conscious embodied ritual um, and I hope uh, Dana once <laughs> one day we could do a missalon on the place of ritual in everyday life but that's that's where I am with uh, Ed and you you brought that forward in me in what you were, in the way that you describe uh, the students and the darkness they're in. Yeah. It's creating, uh, you know, the rituals are the, the foundation for, you know, for meaning making and so many things, you know. So, we, so how do we now recreate ritual? You know, that's an answer to the time that we're in, borrowing on the wisdom of the past. But how can we then recreate so people know that they can move into a mantra, they can move into a prayer, they can move into working with some ritual objects that could do things in community with each other that yes. we would call ritual, but it would be, you know, it would be instructed so that we can really deal with the suffering, with the darkness, so that there is that light that can emerge from it. Um, yeah. I think that's very profound. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you for Campbell, Campbell made the observation that um, uh, metaphor is the native tongue of myth. That as soon as that that the yeah metaphor metaphor is the language, and I'm thinking that rituals are uh, created metaphors for carrying maybe a new myth forward or a, a myth a new myth forward that like in the epic tradition in literature. The, the epic vision always, or most often, scoops from the past what is still valuable and whose shelf life has not expired and pulls that forward into the present so that the, that the current epic is an amalgam of tradition and, uh, to paraphrase Eliot, uh, a new talent, and the two of them together give a new vision of wholeness that can be um, that can be aspired to. It may never be reached, but reaching it is really not the is not the uh, pilgrimage. It's the it's the process. Yeah, I'd like to add that it's interesting to me. No one has used the word shadow. <laughs> with all the conversation about darkness. And I feel um, wary of using spiritual practice for psychological or emotional suffering. I feel very wary about that. So I, 
really am going to live with Rami's sentence. This is what stayed with me. How to live as a blessing in darkness. And I feel that individually and collectively that that's a beautiful um, question to carry into our lives. You know, there, there's a, um, in, in, in Leviticus 19.18, where it says, um, love your neighbor as yourself. There's a commentary from the Hasidic mystical tradition that does what I said earlier, plays with the, the language to, to, to give us something totally different. Uh, Reb Nachman of Braslav, um, 18th century uh, uh, Jewish mystic, takes the, the phrase, ve'ahavta, and you shall love, l'reyecha, your neighbor, kamocha, as yourself, and says, because Hebrew has no vowels, you can change the vowels as you see fit. And he says, you could read the same words, the same verse, and have it say, ve'ahavta, and you shall love, l'ra'echa, your shadow, your evil, your dark side, kamocha, as a part of yourself. And he gives this whole drash, a whole um, talk about his reworking of the text. And he says, as long as you don't embrace your shadow as a part of yourself, you're going to project. No, he doesn't have shadow. He doesn't use the word. He's talking darkness. As long as you project the darkness onto the other, you can never love the other as yourself. So first you have to uh, be aware of your own shadow, do your own shadow work, and then love is possible, but it's impossible without it. So thank you for reminding us of that. Well, it's really important to keep darkness and silence as reference point, as the grounding for whatever we're going to do in life. That we, it, the more we fill darkness with understanding or directions, the less darkness is able to really speak to us and the less we are really able to discern from silence. I, I, as soon as you were saying that, I thought of, you know, the, the, our ancestors' cave paintings mm -hmm. and how so many of them were done uh, in these caves where you had to go into the cave and crawl on your belly to get mm -hmm. to these caves deep in, in the dark. And that's, that was their sacred space, sort of like the dark womb space. In our religions, you walk into bright, fluorescent, lit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, rooms that have no um, magic to them, you know? So, so, yeah, one of the ways of working with this darkness is maybe to, to actually work in darkness mm -hmm. and, and make, in silence and make that part of the ritual, and not keep it so, so well lit or overlit that it's so, so lightened that no enlightenment can happen. I, I have to add to that. I don't know if you know that that is why Orpheus was killed, because he tried to worship Apollo at midnight. He tried to worship light at the wrong time. And then the worshipers of Dionysus then ripped him to shreds. I'm going to send us out into the world with one more sound that takes us into a little silence. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Barbara, My pleasure. Dennis, Thank you all. Connie. Jonah, Thank you, Rami. Gary, Ed, and my good buddy, Will. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh...
Thank you, I, thanks all everybody. Really this was really wonderful. How the, really wonderful. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Thank you all. You're all blessings. Yeah. It's You're been really blessings. nice to go through so much dark with so many of y'all for the last couple of years. That's that's for sure. Thank you.